you can see here, we are coming to the close of our first section in the life of Abraham. A bit of a sad section here as we see the passing of the great matriarch, Sarah. Uh, our passage this morning will come from Genesis chapter 23. We'll consider some things here briefly for our time this morning. And if you have a copy of the Word of God with you, I want to invite you to turn there <clears throat> and follow along as it's read in to your hearing. Sarah lived 127 years. These were the years of the life of Sarah, and Sarah died at uh, Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham went in to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. And Abraham rose up from before his dead and said to the Hittites, I am a sojourner and foreigner among you. Give me property among you for a burying place, that I may bury my dead out of my sight. The Hittites answered Abraham, Hear us, my lord. You are a prince of God among us. Bury your dead in the choicest of our tombs. None of us will withhold from you his tomb to hinder you from burying your dead. Abraham rose and bowed to the Hittites, the people of the land. And he said to them, If you are willing that I should bury my dead out of my sight, hear me and entreat me for entreat for me Ephron of Zoar, that he may give me the cave of Machpelah, which he owns. It is at the end of this field. For the full price, let him give it to me in your presence as property for a burying place. Now Ephron was sitting among the Hittites, and Ephron the Hittite answered Abraham in the hearing of the Hittites. Of all who went in at the gate of his city, no, my Lord, hear me. I give you the field, and I give you the cave that is in it. In the sight of the sons of my people, I give it to you. Bury your dead. Then Abraham bowed down before the people of the land, and he said to Ephron in the hearing of the people of the land, but if you will hear me, I give the price of the field, accept it from me, that I may bury my dead there. Ephron answered Abraham, my Lord, listen to me. A piece of land worth 400 shekels of silver. What is that between you and me? Bury your dead. Abraham listened to Ephron. And Abraham weighed out for Ephron the silver that he had named in the hearing of the Hittites. 400 shekels of silver, according to the weights current among the merchants. So the field of Ephron in Machpelah, which was to the east of Mamre, the field with the cave that was in it and all the trees that were in the field throughout its whole area was made over to Abraham as a possession in the presence of the Hittites before all who went in at the gate of his city. After this, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave of the field of Machpelah, east of Mamre, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. The field and the cave that is in it were made over to Abraham as property for a burying place by the Hittites. God's word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Together, Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you for your goodness and mercy toward us. Lord, we thank you for your word and all the promises contained therein. God, we pray that you would give us understanding. Holy Spirit, open the eyes of our hearts. Turn hearts of stone into hearts of flesh. Remove the block out of deaf ears. Oh God, may my words be yours and what is not of you, let it fall to the ground. Oh God, I pray that you would empower me for this, your service. Not to us be the glory, O Lord, not to us, but to you alone. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, if you turned on the TV yesterday or if you flipped through your Twitter feed or took a small cursory look at Facebook, you would know that there are problems in this land. If you call upon Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you would quickly be reminded that you are a stranger, that you are a sojourner, and this is not, this land as it is, is not your final destination. I don't know about you, but that's how I felt. 
I saw all the hatred, all the racism, all the bigotry well up there in Charlottesville, Virginia. Ironically, a place where the man who drafted the Declaration of Independence lived. And I thought to myself, my, I long for the day when Jesus comes back to restore all things and to usher in his eternal kingdom and to make this land our final dwelling place. That's some of the way I felt. I felt the anger. I felt the frustration. I felt the despair. I felt the, the near cynicism dwelling up in my heart. But then I read the word of God and I'm reminded that there is a better land that awaits us. There is a better land that awaits those who are in Christ Jesus. And when we come to this passage this morning, we see that Abraham's purchase of Sarah's burial foreshadows the fulfillment of God's promise, promised land grant to Abraham's descendants. So we're looking here, and Abraham is purchasing this land. Sarah has passed away, and we're wondering, what in the world? Where is Pastor going with this? But if you'll remember, the land in which Abraham dwells is the land that God told him about from Genesis 11 and 12. And it's the land that God promised his descendants would have. If you'll remember from Genesis 13 and Genesis 15, Abraham walked the land. Abraham, in 13, stayed in the land. Lot left the land. In Genesis 15, he walked it, and the Lord said, your descendants will have this land. And so here we see Abraham holding tightly to God's promises and purchasing and guaranteeing that there will be a place for his future descendants. I divided our text into three sections for our consideration this morning. Sarah's passing in the land, Abraham's purchase of the land, and Sarah's burial in the land. If we look here at verses 1 and 2, it says, Sarah lived 127 years. These were the years of the life of Sarah. And Sarah died at uh, Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham went in to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. So if you'll recall this long journey that Abraham and Sarah have been on together, all the way from Genesis 11 now here to Genesis chapter 24, over three decades have passed. And they have been back and forth wrestling with God. Abraham was a barren woman. She doubted God at times. Abraham doubted God. They made mistakes. They went through a lot together. And now, we've, now they live to uh, experience God's promise. They know without a doubt that God is a God who keeps his word. The God of the Bible keeps his words. His promises find their yes and their amen in Jesus Christ. And now we come to the end of a major era in the biblical story. Sarah is a great woman. She is a woman of renown. All right. Paul said, who is your mother? Is it Hagar? Is it Sarah in Galatians? And we know for those who are in Christ Jesus, Sarah is our mother. She is a woman who was held in high regard. She was a woman who had prominence in God's plan in redemptive history, and now we come to a point where the great patriarch has to see the death of his sidekick, his prime rib, if you will. And Abraham goes in to mourn. It is a day of mourning. They've been through a lot together, but Abraham nonetheless does not mourn as one who is without hope. The rest of his actions signal that. We have to experience death in this life. We have to experience death because of Adam's trespass. Death was brought into the world. That's one thing that we cannot escape. We will all experience death unless Jesus comes back while we're walking. But that is a result of the fall. It is one of the pieces of the curse with which we have to uh, deal. Adam sinned and brought death into the world. And now we see the great matriarch who clung tightly to the true and living God has passed from this physical life to go and be with God. But again, I say that Abraham is not one who mourns as those who are outside of the household of God. Why? Because Abraham reasoned when God told him to sacrifice Isaac that God could actually raise Isaac from the dead. So Abraham longed for the day where his son Jesus Christ, generations down the line, his redeemer would come. 
Abraham goes into mourn with that in mind. Abraham knows that there's a day where the dead will rise, that his beautiful, he will see his beautiful matriarch once again, and they will walk in the land of Canaan, but a better Canaan. And I say to you this morning, beloved, death is something we all will face. But as those who are in Christ, uh, we can look to death with confidence and courage. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that the dead in Christ will raise. Because Christ rose from the dead, we who are in union with Christ will raise from the dead, and it will be a resurrection of glory. Some will res be resurrected to a resurrection of shame, those who are outside of Christ. We see here that Sarah, after 127 years, dies in the land of Canaan. She dies in the land of that God has promised to her and Abraham and their descendants. Abraham mourns for his beautiful bride. But nonetheless, Abraham does not mourn as one who is outside of the household of God. Abraham does not mourn as one who has not received the promises of God. It says in verse 3, we see Abraham's purchase of the land. Abraham rose up from before his dead, uh, rose up from before his dead and said to the Hittites, I am a sojourner and a foreigner among you. That means Abraham is a stranger in this land. Abraham is an outsider in this land. That is the story of the Christian. We are strangers, we are exiles, we are foreigners in this land because this is not our final destination just yet. And Abraham goes and says, give me property among you for a burying place that I may bury my dead from out of my sight. And so Abraham and the Hittite, um, Hittite ruler there, they engage back and forth. Abraham says, I want a piece of land. I want a cave where I can bury Sarah. Now, why would Abraham want to bury Sarah? Why is it so important that he gets this land? Well, if you'll remember, as I mentioned before, God said that your descendants will inhabit this land. And so that's why Abraham is adamant about burying Sarah in this land. Because God made a promise, God made a declaration to Abraham that this particular land on which you stand, this land where you have dwelled in tents, yes, I know that there are other inhabitants in this land. Abraham, this land will belong to your descendants. So what we see is Abraham's faith in action right now. He does not leave this land. He does not leave this land to marry Sarah. He stays right there amongst them. But letting them know he's a stranger, that he's an outsider, he doesn't adhere to their customs with regard to worship. He worships the true and living God, but he asks for a piece of land that he can purchase. Now what's interesting here is the Hittite's response. Verse 6, hear us, my Lord, you are a prince of God among us. Bury your dead in the choicest of our tombs. None of us will withhold from you his tomb to hinder you from bearing your dead. Abraham rose and bowed, and he said to them, If you are willing, I should bury my dead out of my sight. Hear me and entreat for me Ephron of Zoar, that he may give me the cave of Machpelah, which he owns. It is at the end of the field for the full price. Abraham does not want to have the land granted to him for free. I want you all to take note of that. Abraham does not want to take the land from them for free. Abraham wants to pay full price. So there is unequivocally, there's no doubt that he has ownership over this land. And it will mean something for his descendants. Ephron was sitting, we're sent among the Hittites, and Ephron the Hittite answered Abraham in the hearing of the Hittites. Of all who went into, went in the gate of the city, no, my Lord, hear me, I give you the field, and I give you the cave that is in it. In the sight of the sons of my people, I give it to you. Bury your dead. So now they are haggling over whether they should pay or whether Abraham should get the land for free. Boy, wouldn't it be great if you worked in retail when somebody said to you, no, 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 I want to pay for a price. I don't want the discount. Huh? But they are trying to manipulate the situation, if you will. It's part of ancient Near Eastern custom to expand the territory of the land and hopes that a person would offer a higher amount for it and uh, give a, and, and, and hopes that the person would give a greater gift 
for the territory. All right? There's, there could be some of that happening here in this sequence, but Abraham refuses. Just as he refused to take anything from the king of Sodom, Abraham is saying here, I'm going to purchase this land before your people as a demonstration, as a witness, as a guarantee that this belongs to my descendants. Do you hear me this morning? Abraham is purchasing that land on faith. God has declared to him that your descendants will live in that land. And Abraham is doing what he can physically, instrumentally, to make sure that there's a monument there for his people to understand that this is the land that God has granted to us. God gave Abraham the resources to purchase this land. Listen here, what does he say? Keep going down. Verse 16, Abraham listened to Ephron, and Abraham weighed out for Ephron the silver that he had named in the hearing of the Hittites, 400 shekels of silver according to the weights current among the merchants. That was an inflated cost. That was an excessive amount of land when you consider other places in the Bible. Jeremiah paid about 17 shekels for his piece of land. And here we have Abraham, Abraham being charged 400 shekels. So we see here some manipulation. We see here some toying around by the king of the Hittites, but Abraham makes the payment. Abraham understands that God has made a promise to him and that there's nothing too great to give up for the promise that God has made to him. Hear me this morning. Abraham offers over the 400 shekels. He wants to make a declaration. He wants to declare to his descendants that this land is the place where you will dwell. When we turn to Hebrews, the Hebrew writer tells us in Hebrews 11, 17 through 19 that Abraham looked to a greater city. Abraham looked to a city whose builder was God. Listen to what he says in verse uh, chapter 11. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it is said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. Jump down to verse, um, um, of whom it is said, through Isaac your offspring. Verse 19, he considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which he figuratively speaking did, and God received him back. Now, if you... Jump up here to verse uh, 8. It says that Abraham, by faith, obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And when he went out, not knowing where he was going, by faith he went in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs of the same promise. Verse 10, for he was looking forward to the city that has foundations whose designer and builder is God. We have the offspring and we have the land. God says, I want to test you, give up the offspring. Abraham says, I believe that God can raise him from the dead. Now we have Sarah's death and Abraham says, I want to purchase a piece of this land. See, Abraham is living in light of a greater promise. Abraham has a better day in mind, and so he stakes his claim in the ground as a reminder to his coming generations that this is the land of your dwelling. Jesus said to store up treasures in heaven where the moth and the rust cannot destroy. Abraham is making an eternal investment right now. The Hebrew writer says that Abraham knows that this land will be transformed. Abraham knows that this land of Canaan, the promised land, will have a better appearance. It will be more inhabitable, if you will, when his Redeemer comes. Jesus says to store up treasures for yourself in heaven where moth and rust cannot destroy. 400 shekels was no big deal in light of eternity, in light of the promise that God had made to Abraham. He was willing to give it all up. I had a friend that said to me, you know, Mike, I can't take my money with me, but I can sure send it ahead. We see Abraham, we see the death of Sarah in the land. We see Abraham's 
purchase of the land, and we see Sarah's burial here. So now Abraham goes a step further. Not only does he act on finding a place for the matriarch, not only does he move forward and stake out a piece of territory, he purchases it, but he continues, and it says in verse 17, so the field of Ephron and Machpelah, which was to the east of Mamre, the field with the cave that was in it, and all the trees that were in the field throughout its whole area was made over to Abraham as a possession in the presence of the Hittites before all who went in at the gate of his city. So Abraham leaves with more than just the cave. He gets the cave and the surrounding land. Okay. He gets quite a bit of territory there. Verse 19, after this, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave in the land of Canaan. And the field and the cave that is in it were made over to Abraham as property for a burying place by the Hittites. So they haggle, they settle. Abraham purchases the cave, and he also purchases the land around Machpelah, that is east of Mamre, the location where he took up residence for a time. Beloved, I want you to see here Abraham's intentionality. I want you to see Abraham's faith here, Abraham's firm belief. He could despair, oh, my beautiful wife is gone at this time, but Abraham believes something about God's promise, and it prompts him to move forward. It prompts him to go ahead and bury Sarah in this land, signifying that this land right here, Sarah, will be our resting place, albeit better. And what we have here is a partial fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham. God said, Abraham, you will own this land one day. And now Abraham owns it by the blessing of God. We see it's a partial fulfillment of the promise. And Israel would look at this episode right here throughout history as they're getting ready to conquer the land in Canaan. And they would be reminded that their great patriarch and all and several patriarchs subsequent to Abraham were buried in that same territory. They would realize that this is the land that God said we must possess. They would see Abraham walking in faith and refusing to have it as a free gift, giving no, no great, no money, a amount of money was too great. They would see Abraham as one who was walking in faith saying that, I believe that this is what God has called us to be. And it would motivate them to trust in God's promises, just as their great patriarch trusted in the promises of God. And beloved, let me tell you something the same is no less true for us who are in Jesus Christ. For this promise finds its ultimate fulfillment in Jesus Christ who said, Blessed are the meek, for they will, they shall inherit the earth. What do you think Jesus is saying, beloved? Jesus is saying that that episode right there in Genesis 23, when Abraham is laying uh, claim to this land, is true for us as well. Jesus is saying that those who are in him will inherit this earth right here, this very land, I don't know what Cayley Avenue will look like when Jesus returns. But I do know that Jesus promised that those who are meek, that is those who submit to the will of the Father, Abraham submitted to the will of the Father. Do you hear me this morning? Those who trust in Jesus Christ for their salvation will inherit this territory. We will not be floating around like disembodied goblins and ghouls. We will have glorified bodies and we will inherit this land transformed and renewed. Jesus said, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And this is the same land that John saw in Revelation 21. When he looked and beheld Jerusalem descending down from heaven, and he heard the voice of God say, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. And do you think Abraham saw? He saw the city. He saw this renewed land generations before. He saw the same land that John saw. Isaiah saw this land too. He saw the new creation. And he tells us that in this land, there are no more tears. In this land, there is no more pain. And in this land, there is no more sickness, there is no more heartache, there is no more racial strife. For in this land, God has made his resting place. And 
That's the land that Abraham sees. That's the land that John sees. At the end of history, brothers and sisters, history is going somewhere. God graciously has given us the end of the story in Revelation 21. He's already revealed to us how glorious the end will be. Listen, in this land, death is put to death. That's the glorious land that awaits us. It's a new heavens, it's a new earth, it's a new creation where God has promised to establish his kingdom. It'll be right here on earth. I want to offer a few applications for you this morning. How then shall we live in light of God's promises? How do we handle the prospect of death? The loss of loved ones. How do we handle the prospect of death personally in our own lives? But we have confidence. We can take courage. We can take heart when a loved one dies in Christ because we know that death is not the final place. That death is the passage to go and be with the true and living God. Although we are sad, we can rejoice because when we die in this life, we give up everything to gain eternity. So we can take comfort when we think about the prospect of death. We have no need as the people of God to fear death. You may wonder how many days you have left. You can look. You can look the portal of death, the passage of time in the face, and say that death is the passing point to be with my God. That's the promise that we have in Jesus Christ. That's the hope that we offer to a dying world. That's the hope that we offer to people who donate their bodies to cryogenics because they are afraid of death and they want to live in this land forever. I don't know about you, but I don't want to live on this earth the way it is forever. I don't want to wake up all the days of my life seeing Charlottesville, Virginia over and over again. I don't want to wake up all the days of my life with pain in my body. I don't want to wake up all the days of my life with headaches. I don't want to wake up all the days of my life with joint pains. I don't want to wake up all the days of my life without a perfect body. And in that land, all those things await us. What do we do? in light of this reality. We can invest in eternal real estate even now. We can live our lives with abundant generosity just as Abraham was willing to give up his money, just as Abraham was willing to give up his time, his treasures to the Lord for the sake for the sake of God's promises. We can do the same thing laughing knowing that all of our being is being invested for the eternal kingdom. When we give of our time, our talent and our resources to the to the promotion and the proliferation of the word of God, we are making an eternal investment. A return that far outweighs what we put into it. Time can't compare to eternity. So like Abraham, we can trust God's promises and give everything for the sake of this land that awaits us. As we finish this morning, my wife's uncle used to live here in Central Florida back when a mysterious man was walking around the city uh, buying up a whole bunch of wetlands south of here for next to nothing. And everybody wondered, what is this man from way out of town doing buying up all this land, all this land that's seemingly uninhabitable? That man's name was Walt Disney. And my wife's uncle, who was 95 at the time, and her great aunt sat next to me and said and he said to me Mike had I known and recently I spoke to Aunt Mady and she said Mike we own some lake property but we sold it too soon I came to serve notice to you all this morning that just as Walt Disney transformed that barren land into a an oasis, if you will. Jesus Christ says to us this morning, I have a better land. I have laid my claim to this earth. And the Bible says that Jesus is going to establish 
his eternal kingdom right here. It will be a far better land than anything we could ever imagine. And he's saying, if you want a better land, then place your trust in Jesus Christ now, and you'll inherit that true eternal kingdom, that true oasis, where there's no more heartache, there's no more sickness, there's no more pain. And when you face the prospect of death, you can laughingly say that a better land awaits those who are in Christ Jesus. Let us pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you for your goodness and mercy toward us. We thank you for all the promises.